For the cause of Christ the King, we give our lives an offering till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the Son. For the cause of Christ we go with joy to reap. You may be seated. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here to worship the risen Savior with us. It is for him that we are here. It is for the cause of Christ that we serve. Well, this morning is a very special morning. We are celebrating the ordination of our brother Harry Longen to the office of elder here at Faith Baptist Church. Now, ordination is the appointing of a man to one of the offices of the church, either elder or deacon, with prayer and the laying on of hands. It's a public and formal recognition of what God has done in the calling and gifting of this servant leader for the task. And an ordination does not make an elder or a deacon. God makes an elder or a deacon. An ordination recognizes what God has done in calling the man to this role. It does not invest in him power like a worldly leader. 
We know that so many worldly leaders will try and lord over others with the power of their position, but it is not so in Christ's church. Elders and deacons are to be servant leaders who lay down their lives for Christ's sheep. So it's right for the church to celebrate an ordination. Sometimes ordinations are left for Sunday afternoon services at about four o'clock where uh, the, the person being ordained and their family and some other pastors and deacons get together. But this is something that's wonderful in the life of the church and ought to be celebrated and ought to be put forward because in so doing, the church is praising God for his convenu- uh, continuing provision for her. An ordination service is a joyful act of worship, and it's recognizing the continuing work of God's grace in his church. We hear how the Spirit has worked and is working in the life of the one who is being ordained. We hear the scriptural charge from, uh, for, the, for the person who is being ordained as well as for the church and how they are to respond and to support those in the leadership roles. And we sing of God's amazing grace, don't we? And we see in all of this how utterly impossible it is to complete this task apart from Christ. If it is not for him and the work of God in the life of an elder or a deacon, he would not be able to carry out the responsibilities of the task that are set before him. The work begins in his regeneration and his justification. And that's why we'll hear Brother Harry's testimony of how God saved him. But we'll also hear how that continuing, ongoing sanctification is taking place in Harry's life as well that has brought him to this moment in this place. And so an ordination service like this is a reminder to Christ's church of the greatness, the goodness, and the graciousness of our God and how worthy of worship he truly is. Will you join me in prayer as we begin? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with a song of praise in our heart. And Father, we come with just humble adoration of who you are as we think of this creation in which we live, as we look at the sky and we see this beautiful world around us, we think of the loving hands that created it. We think of the God who spoke and it was. And Father, we think of the God who, despite our rebellion and our sin, loved us so much that he sent the Son, Jesus Christ, to stand in our place, to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins so that we might have a reconciled relationship to you. Father, we are thankful that by knowing Christ, we are adopted into your family and that we now make up the body known as the church. Father, as we prepare to enter into this worship service, I pray that you help us to put aside any of the distractions that might take our minds and our hearts off of you. And Father, I pray that we are able to lift up a joyful noise to your ears as we sing, as we pray, and as we hear the proclamation of your word this morning. We do so so that Christ may be honored and magnified. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's see if this works this time. Oh, man, maybe not. Maybe? Is it working? Is it working? All right. Thanks, Evie. There we go. Hey, all right. Now I know it's working. All right. So um, as we get started this morning, we are going to sing a few songs. Um, So we'll have you stand with us. Um, I think this is a perfect song for this morning. Um, As we celebrate with Harry his his dedication and his following of of Christ Jesus as he's laid down for for Harry's life, um, we're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. So will you sing it with us this morning? 
may be seated. I've enjoyed getting to know this brother in Christ uh, more closely over the last year as we've gone through the vetting process. Um, I've appreciated another guy who's not afraid to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and meet for coffee, which was nice. <laughs> I also always appreciate another man who appreciates a good flat top. <laughs> but much more importantly than those things, I've come to know Harry as somebody who loves Christ very, very deeply and very genuinely. He's a very humble man, and I think that every day, Harry is amazed at God's grace in his life, and he speaks to that. When we've, when we've met, as we've begun to meet as elders, he talks about that, and I know that, uh, again, he has a very genuine faith. He loves God. He's a hungry student of God's word, uh, he and Pastor meet on a regular basis to dig even deeper into God's Word because Harry has that hunger and desire. And I've just appreciated so much getting to know him. And I look forward to serving with him for many, many years as a fellow elder. And so with that, I'll introduce Brother Harry. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, just to let you know, uh, I was born in Louisiana, and I was, I was raised in a Catholic home. But it wasn't a devout home. Um, and most of you know that in Catholicism, they teach you that living a good life, that you, that's the way to get to heaven. And so, but pretty much, I spent my childhood and teen years uh, without hope in, in heaven. So... I, I quit trying to, to do good works and stuff, and I, I was starting to get into some trouble in my life. And so I thought the, the military would, would help me. And so I went, in, I went into the military, but this wasn't the answer for me. The military did help me to mature, though, and, but there, there was still a void in my life, and I, I felt there was still something missing. But while I was in the military, my dad passed away. And the military released me. I came home and was home for good. And, but there was still something missing, and I just didn't know what. And so it wasn't until I had an accident that nearly cost me my life. And that's when I realized that there was something that I that I needed, but I didn't know what. And my, my cousin, uh, who was a believer, was talking to me about God. And he talked, and he introduced me to our, my, his pastor, who shared, the, uh, who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with me. And it was at that moment that I realized that I was a sinner, and I needed a savior. It, it was also at that point that I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, and I was baptized. Uh, I, as I was going to church there for a little bit, I, I was introduced to uh, a, a fellow, Gerald Abair, who became my best friend. He was my mentor uh, and helped him and I got together uh, two or three times a week. And we studied for hours, and we was using uh, sermon series by John MacArthur as our study guide and stuff like that. And it helped me to grow tremendously in my Christian walk. And so we did. We was there for about a year. We spent all kind of hours, and then then we went, and then I met Kay in about 1984, 1985. We were married. In 1986, we moved here to Michigan. So it, everything happened so suddenly. And we, we have three children. Uh, our daughter, Lindsay, who's married to Dave, and our grandchildren, uh, Liam and Logan, and our son, Cody, and his wife, Ann, and our youngest son, Landon. And over the years, 
I had the privilege of serving God in different capacities uh, as a Sunday school teacher, a WANA worker, and a deacon. And it was about, I think, three years ago, Kay and I felt that the Lord was leading us here to this church. And um, so we came and we became members. And then last year, uh, I was approached and asked if I would, I was approached and asked if I would serve. And I asked if I could think and pray about it. And so I prayed for it for about a week. And I felt that this was what God was calling me to do. So with that, I want to say that I'm very thankful and humble to have the opportunity to serve God in Faith Baptist Church. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, we're going to have you stand with us. We're going to sing another song together here. Victory in Jesus.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we're just so thankful, Father, that we can proclaim that. Lord, following uh, Harry's testimony, um, Lord, he's experienced that victory in Jesus, Lord. That cleansing flood, Lord, that is only brought by you, Father, who can come and fill that void within each and every one of us, Lord. So we praise you for your grace and for your victory, Lord, over death in each of us. Oh, Father, we just pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, good morning. So the text that we'll be using today, if you'd like to follow along and you can, uh, you can, you can go there, is Acts chapter 20, and we'll mainly be in verses 28 through 31. So this morning, when we, before I, before I uh, get into the, the scripture that we'll read together, we're going to talk about three things this morning. Number one, we'll talk for a moment about the role of an elder, because I think it's important for us to remind ourselves of the role of the elder in the church and what that office is and what it is not, because in many churches uh, today, um, it's not appropriately uh, structured, I would say. And we'll talk about why that's important, aside from that it's modeled in the New Testament. And then we'll give a charge to the elder, to Brother Harry. And that's kind of like marching orders, if you will. That's meant to be that now that you've been, uh, are being ordained into this role, um, I'll challenge him with uh, some words from Scripture. And then we'll have a charge to the congregation. And that is for the rest of us. And I'll talk about what our role is to support uh, the elders and also to uh, maintain uh, spiritual health within our own church. And so that's, that's the kind of the three main areas that we'll focus on today. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again for the work that you've done in Brother Harry's life throughout the years. Lord, we, we are just celebrate your sovereign grace in his life, Lord, from the day that you saved him and those years where you uh, put a mentor in his life to help study your word and to understand his calling on your life all the way up till today, Lord. His life has been in your hands and we thank you for that. And as today, as we... As we look at your word and we look at these words that Paul had for the uh, elders of uh, Ephesus, uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to take from that what, what we should learn and how we can apply it here today in this church and uh, how we can challenge ourselves and challenge our brother according to your word. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, I'd like to take a few minutes here to speak about the role of the elder in the New Testament church. So an elder is a pastor, a shepherd of a flock. And we see that in the text here today where Paul uses that reference as a flock. An, an elder is the role and a pastor is a description of that role. They're not two separate distinct positions. They're not two different uh, functions in the church. Okay? And when we think about the word shepherd, we understand what that means when they take care of a, a flock of sheep. Right? They care for them and they protect them. And that's exactly where the word pastor comes from. And obviously, pastor is probably the most common term that we use uh, when we're talking about or to an elder. I always refer to Pastor Roy and other pastors that uh, have been my pastors in my life. I think it's appropriate and respectful to call them Pastor Roy or Pastor Stilly was a pastor that we had in a church for many, many years. But really, that's a description of the role of the elder. Okay, so it's important to understand that those are not separate and distinct from one another. We also see that an elder is an overseer. Paul uses that description as well. He calls them overseers. Now, again, it's a description, and that word overseer can also mean a guardian or a curator. Okay, so now we've looked at a shepherd that cares for a flock. It protects them. He makes sure that they're fed well, that they're cared for and also an overseer that's a guardian or, or curator. So there's different descriptions of the role of an elder in a church. And I would, I would tell you that in uh, most uh, modern day churches where there's multiple elders that typically, and not always, but typically there's a full-time paid elder who we call the pastor, and he primarily is teaching and preaching like Pastor Roy does here, but that there's other elders that come alongside him to help him in the ministry. And we're not able, as lay people, to spend as much time teaching and studying and even connecting with the congregation because of our duties and our jobs outside of church. But each of those are elders, and they're each, they have the same calling and the same responsibilities. They're just not all able to spend as much time in those roles because of outside job duties. 
but the point that I think is very important for us to understand is when you're reading in the New Testament and you see the word elder and overseer and shepherd and pastor, they're all the same thing and they're all a description of an elder. The third point that I think is vitally important for us to understand is that elders are to be a plurality. And I will tell you that until I came here and fell under the teaching of Pastor Roy and both through his teaching and through looking in scripture to understand the importance of a plurality. You'll not find anywhere in the New Testament where Paul says you have to have multiple people in your church. It's not that clear of a commandment. But in every instance where the word is used, elder, it's plural. The elders of this church or go establish elders in that area or call the elders. If you look at the scripture that we're reading today in the, I think it's verse 27, he called the elders, plural, from Ephesus, from the church, singular. So he didn't call multiple elders from multiple churches in the Ephesus area. He called the plural elders from the church in Ephesus. That's one example. And if you read throughout the New Testament, you'll see that it's always a plurality, unless they're describing a single person. So maybe they're talking about an elder in this church. But when they talk about the leadership in the church, it's always plurality. Now, the fact that it's modeled that way in the New Testament is enough for us to follow it, all right? That alone. But I'd like to talk about two practical reasons that we should do this. And I think that you guys, as I go through these reasons, that you'll be able to understand and have seen churches that don't follow this and see that there's really two uh, risks, if you will, when this model is not followed. The first risk is that a single pastor, a single elder, can lord it over his congregation. You heard pastor use that terminology today, that without a lack of accountability of other elders, someone who shouldn't be in that role anyways can begin to have a amount of control and influence over the congregation that can be very destructive. Now, I will say that that is not the norm. That's just because the church only has one pastor. That's not always going to happen. But I will tell you that I know of churches that are a short commute from this very church that have this in place. And it's not healthy at all for the church. And it can, be, it can lead to spiritual abuse of the congregation because there's a lack of accountability. I've seen churches where there's one pastor and he has one deacon. And that deacon does whatever he's told without asking any questions. And essentially he's his gopher, if you will. And that is an unhealthy biblical model for the church for many reasons that you can understand. On the flip side, churches that have one elder, one pastor, who is a godly man, who desires to serve the Lord, who desires to do everything he can to serve the congregation, can be quickly and easily overwhelmed by doing the job all by themselves. The role of pastor, although I've never been a full-time pastor, I've been around him for quite a while, and I know that there's many joys and many blessings that men in that role receive. But there's also many very difficult decisions. There's very messy conflicts that they have to be involved in. There's difficult decisions about the future of the church. There's challenging decisions about what should we be teaching about over the course of the next many months. There's many burdens that can come upon the pastor. And if it weren't for other elders to come alongside him and to help him, they can become overwhelmed and they can become burned out. And I've also seen this happen to men, again, who have good intentions and they're, they're diligent in their work and in their calling, but they don't have other elders. And so they take all that on, on themselves. And it can, that also can be very destructive to them. And ultimately, when it's destructive to them, it's destructive to the church. So those are three important things about the role of elder that I wanted to cover today. So now... Onto the charge, charge to the elder, to charge to the brother Harry today. Paul writes, he says to pay careful attention to yourself. Brother Harry, your primary number one responsibility will always be your growth and your relationship with the Lord Jesus. In this role, and Pastor mentioned this the other night during our elder meeting, that sometimes we can get busy in the work and doing the job and doing the work and begin to neglect our devotions and our spiritual discipline with the Lord. And it can happen, and it can happen slowly over time. 
and it can undermine the work that you've been called to do. So as Paul says to pay attention, pay close attention to yourself. Be diligent in your devotions. Be diligent in studying the word of God like you are now. I know that you are. I'm challenging to, to, to keep that up, to use the word of God as a mirror that you look into to see yourself and to know, as you said, you're amazed by the grace that God has shown you. And that tells me that you have a heart that God is working in. Ask the Lord to convict you and to lead you into greater, greater holiness. Sanctification is never just this clean, linear path. The pastor has used this example before. If we saw it as a, as a chart or a graph, it, it will trend up in time if we're, if we're growing in our sanctification and holiness, but it has its ups and downs. And don't ever, don't ever, don't, don't ever get lax in your, in your devotion and your discipline to the Lord. Be in prayer each day. Be in his word each day. Saturate yourself with his word. Listen to it when you're driving. And I know you do these things. We've talked about that. You and I, he and I both spend quite a bit of time in our cars and we both enjoy listening to John MacArthur and other good preachers. Listen to good books. Saturate yourself in God's word. Continue to grow in holiness. And when you, when you face challenges in your spiritual walk, Always know that you have other men in this church that would not love nothing more than to help you through any challenges that you face. I know that Pastor Wood, that I would, that Kirk would, that Bob would, that our deacons would, Scott, Andy, others would, Chris would. We're here to help you because we want to see you grow and be effective in your role as elder for the Lord. It also says to pay careful attention to the church body. And it talks about the danger that we have of false teaching coming into the church. We have to be careful of any kind of false teaching that comes into the church, maybe by somebody who's here already and has, has learned something from an outside source and is zealous about it and wants to, wants to bring it into the church. We have to address that in love, but, but very... Uh, uh, I say aggressively, but with love, any false teaching. There may be someone new who comes to our church who also would bring false teaching. You know, and Paul said that he knows when he leaves that that will happen. Not only will it come into the church, but it could come in from within the church. And we have to be very, very careful about that. That is one of the things that we have to be most diligent about to ensure that false teaching doesn't come in. And we know that false teaching is everywhere around us. If you, if you watch any kind of media or what read read books there's many many good sources of material there's great preachers that we can listen to there's great books that we can read but there's also some that are although have some truth they have poison in them a false teaching and we have to be careful that that doesn't come in to our own church family and also on that topic of to pay careful attention to the church body an elder has to be watchful of the needs of the flock I wish that I knew more of you better than I do. One person can't know everyone as closely as what is needed. But I will challenge you as an elder, as I challenge myself on a regular basis, to get to know the people of our church. And the more I get to know the people of our church, the more blessed that I am. But it's important for us to be sensitive and always watchful of the needs in our church body. Pastor typically knows about everything that's going on because A, it's his role, but B, he's, he's, he pays careful attention in this way. And so when we meet, and you've seen this already, when we meet and we discuss uh, where, we, where we have needs and what, where we need to go help and support people, typically pastor uh, has a better feel on that, again, because he's able to uh, spend more time doing that. But I'm, I would challenge you, as I challenge myself as a lay elder, to get to know people. And even sometimes, and this is really hard, go to the other side of the congregation and because it's like two different churches it feels like sometimes. <laughs> but to, to reach out and get to know them, to make a phone call, to send a message, right, and let them know that you're praying for them, and to be praying for people here in the church, that's, we're called to pay careful attention to the church body, to the health of the church body and what's happening here. I also know from serving in ministry for both here and other places that uh, my wife is a good source of information. She knows sometimes things that are happening that I don't, that I know that then we can get involved and help and be a blessing to somebody. 
that's another source I know that Kay would do the same to know if there's a need in the church body. So her, other elders, other believers in the church, stay in tune with what's going on so that you can, you can go and help and support where needed. Strive to get to know the congregation. Be ready to invite people into your home. As I said, make an effort to get to know people that you don't know. Get to know them a little bit better. And the ones that you do know, continue to build that relationship. Paul also mentions that we're guardians of the most precious possession, that the, the, the church was bought by the precious blood of Christ. And I know the kind of weight that that makes me feel, and I'm sure that it makes you feel as well. This is the church was so precious to the Lord that he paid for it with his own blood. And it's an enormous responsibility. And trust me, brother, when I'm saying these things to you, I'm saying them back right to myself too, because that's exactly, as a fellow elder, I understand this. But there's simply nothing more precious on earth than that which was bought by the blood of our Savior. And you've been called to care for, protect, and shepherd this body of his. And I think it's natural and easy as humans for us to become complacent in our duties. That's, that's what naturally happens if we're not diligent, for all of us to tend towards that. But always remember the importance of the calling. It is Christ's own body, which he bought with his very own blood. Never forget that fact, my brother. And then, the final charge I would give you, I will quote from the Apostle Paul. And he says... And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all of those who are sanctified. And so my charge now to the congregation, and I count myself in that, because we've given our charge to Brother Harry. Now my charge to the congregation will be based on the same text, so we'll stay right there. Because I think there's much that, the, that a church body needs to glean from these words that Paul had to these elders. Pay close attention to your own faith. The job of elder, the job of deacon, becomes much, much easier when you're shepherding and leading a congregation that is a student of God's word, is hungry for God's word, is studying God's word, and obeying God's word. And I would tell you that I sense that that's the case here. A strong congregation is consistently in God's word, working to understand the truths within it and defend themselves against false teaching. Always, always be on the lookout. Not to a level of paranoia, but almost. There is so much false teaching in our world today that it's, 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 it's actually very scary because I know many believers who want to learn and grow. You know, They want to have a daily devotional. They want to spend time in God's word, and so they go and they follow someone on YouTube or they listen to podcasts or they read books and these are all wonderful things that we want for all of you and for all of us to be doing but be careful about who you follow and who you listen to because some of them you'll listen to and you'll hear they'll talk about scripture they'll talk about God but they're teaching a false gospel not all but some and I would say that if you if you ever have a question and wonder Ask, ask a fellow believer, ask an elder. We'd be happy to, to direct you in that. And I've had to grow through that myself over the years to be very careful about who I follow and who I listen to. But be students of God's word. Saturate yourselves in God's word. Grow in holiness. And to also pay close attention to one another. Now, I will tell you that I think that this church does an exceptionally good job with this. And I'm not just saying that because I love you guys and when you're here with me. But I really mean this. We, Shelley and I and the family have, have uh, this is probably really about the third church that we've been a part of for a significant amount of time over the 27 years that we've been married. And I, I could tell you in each church that there's probably something that they do really well. And I think that one of the things that I see here that this congregation does so well is to care for one another. And again, I know that not all of you know all the others closely. I get that, right? We can't. There's too many of us. But I've seen too many times where somebody that I didn't even know was going through a struggle, and maybe, and that's fine. I didn't need to know. 
but I see people come alongside them here at, before the service, after the service, and love on them and pray with them and cry with them. And I had no clue, which is great that there's that kind of relationships. And I, and I, think, that, I think that the majority of our church congregation does have others in the congregation that they're close to, that they can call when there's times of trouble, when they can reach out to. And I would just encourage you to keep doing that, to keep that love and that health, that spiritual health up amongst each other. And for those that are fairly new to our congregation, well, someone's probably coming for you because they're going to, you know, I see new people come and it's like, you know where the new people are. Maybe you can't see them, but there's a crowd of people around them. And I love that. I love to see how we do that. But if you're new to our congregation, reach out and build relationships. You, again, you're not going to be able to build a, a, a strong, deep relationship with everybody here. That's not feasible. But you'll be able to build a strong and uh, intimate relationships with other church families and other, other our church members. And that's so important that we continue to do that because that's another way that the body stays healthy is to have those kind of relationships. And then the last charge that I'll give the congregation in regards to this, in regards to Brother Harry being called as an elder today, is to pray for Harry. Lift him up in your prayers. I can tell you that when any of us step out to serve in any role, when we want to serve and advance the kingdom and we're going to grow in our faith and any time that we're trying to do more for the Lord, not to earn our salvation, but in, in reaction to what he's done to us when we want to serve him more, that you are going to get attacked, that it's, there's going to be problems, and there's going to be challenges. And so pray for Harry, pray for Harry and Kay, pray for their family, because I know that there can be spiritual attacks and most likely will be with him taking on this responsibility. And let him know you're praying for him when you do, because I know that means a great deal uh, to him and to others. And so with that, again, very excited to be a part of this today, brother. I'm so excited to be able to serve alongside you. I'm so glad that God called you to this role. Uh, I've already enjoyed as we've begun to meet, uh, you know, through the, through the, through the summer, uh, we were going through the vetting process, and then when the church voted, we began to, began to meet as elders together, and it's just been, it's been a joy. It's really been a joy. I know Pastor feels the same way. It's just been such a joy to have you, uh, to meet with us and talk and and pray over the things of the church, and I cannot wait to see what God has in store for you and for our church. It's truly a blessing to be a part of this church body. And I don't even have this as my notes today, but as I, as I thought through this and thought through these things and I thought about my charge to the congregation, I cannot express how joyful that I've been, and I think I speak for my family since we've come here. I keep saying three years, but then the other day I think it's almost five now, but however long it's been, the summer of 2016 that we came here and to be a part of the body and the, just the, the love that uh, we, we feel in this church, that we see. Again, we don't, we don't have close relationships with every single per person here, but it's so wonderful to see all that going on and to have, have developed. We've, we have people that we would call our very best friends now here and to hear the faithful, articulate, passionate preaching from this pulpit every Sunday is absolutely, absolutely a blessing. And to have our, our faithful Sunday school teachers that you know, we, we enjoy sitting under uh, every, every Sunday, it's so good to be back and have that and to, and to be together in Sunday school. It's a different setting to be able to you know, talk with one another during that time and a little less formal. Um, it's such a joy. Uh, I look forward to being here every Sunday. And, and I, I truly do. I love being here. I love being a part of this church body. And I just thank God for it. So with all that being said, I'm going to pray, and then I think we're going to have some folks come up. I'll let, I'll let Pastor direct that, because if not, I'll forget somebody. So let's pray and go before the Lord. Father, we just thank you again for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, we look over the last three weeks, and a baby dedication, a baptism, an ordination, as Brother Max said earlier today, Father, there is so much joy in that and to see how you're growing our church. Maybe not always numerically, and that's okay, but you're growing us spiritually, Lord. And we are seeing new people come, and we're so excited when we see new people come. And Lord, we know that it's in your hands whether, and whether they stay and grow or not, and we'll do our part to welcome them and love them. Lord, I thank you for Brother Harry. 
I thank you again for what you've done in his life. Thank you for he and Kay. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to uh, strengthen their marriage, that Christ would be at the very center of it. Lord, that you would, you would grow them both in holiness. Father, thank you for their service here in the church. Lord, you've transformed their lives over the years as you converted them and then sanctified them, and here they are serving faithfully. And we, we thank you as a congregation for them as they serve uh, teaching in Sunday school and now as, a, as an elder, that they're such a blessing to our congregation. I pray you'd protect them. I pray you give them wisdom. Watch over them. Help us to love them. Help us to pray for them. Uh, Lord, uh, help us to continue to, to grow. Lord, protect us from false teaching. Lord, protect us from division. Lord, thank you for the unity that we've seen in this church body, especially over the last year when so many churches have uh, seen division and even splits over, over things that are irrelevant, Lord, in the scheme of things. But you've, you've kept this church united, and I thank you for that. Father, we, uh, we, just, uh, we give you this uh, service. We give you the remainder of it as, uh, as Harry's. We pray over he and Kay, and we just pray you would move in them. And Lord, uh, just again, thank you for all that you're doing. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Well, thank you, Brother Jason, and for the challenge and charge from God's Word. Uh, it is too much for any one man to serve as an elder in God's church. It is too much for any group of men to serve as elders in God's church, but it is not too much for God-empowered men to serve as elders in His church. And so I'm very thankful for that. And Harry, you're about to find out just how true that statement is. But Jason, Harry, if you don't mind, bring a couple of chairs right over here. I'm going to ask Miss Kay to come up and join us, and also any of our ordained men to come up as well uh, to lay hands on Brother Harry and Brother uh, Miss Kay here. Um, so I'll have you guys come on up, and we will uh, uh, pray over them. So if you're if you're deacon, come on up too. Yep. I saw you get up, Chris, and sit down. So come on. Just kind of gather around here and, and jump in here. And church, we're going to have you pray with us as well uh, over Brother Harry and Miss Kay and uh, for this very important role that he is about to take on. So will you join us now? Heavenly Father, we come with joy in our hearts over how we see you working in your people. Father, I'm amazed constantly to see what I see. Father, your church here is alive, and it's alive because it's filled with your spirit. And Father, we see that in the growth of your disciples, and we see it in how you are constantly providing for your church. Today is just one example of that as we ordain Brother Harry to the ministry of an elder. Father, I ask you now to pour out your grace upon him, to fill him with your spirit, to give him wisdom and clarity of mind for the decisions that have to be made. Father, I ask you to give him grace for those challenging moments because we know they come. We know they'll be here. And Lord, we need your grace in order to, to meet those challenges head on. Father, I thank you that you have already won the day, just as we sang today. We've heard victory in Jesus, and we have that. Praise God. I thank you for my brother Harry. I, I look forward to serving alongside of him in the coming years as, as you see fit to give us. Father, I pray for this church that you would continue to bless it, to continue to raise up leaders from within her, Leaders who love you, who are dedicated to you, who want to see the name of Jesus made great in Battle Creek and to the ends of the earth. 
Father, I also want to pray especially right now for Miss Kay. I know what it's like for a wife of an elder. I know the challenges that they face as they love and support their husbands. Father, when they see the stress and the, the difficulty from situations that they know about that they can't speak of, and sometimes there's just no words to express. But Father, I know that if it were not for faithful wives who hold us up in prayer, who love us, who support us, this job would just be so overwhelming. So Father, I do pray for her. I pray for her strength, that she would be able to stand strong in the midst of the battle that's ahead. Father, I pray for her love, for her husband, for you, for your church. I pray against any bitterness that might try to find a way into her heart, whether it's because she heard somebody say something about her husband or about the church or something like that because of a decision that had to be made. I pray that, that she's able to fight against that spirit of bitterness and that she is able to maintain the focus on Jesus alone. I pray now, Father, for Harry and Kay's family, for their children and their grandchildren. I think it is a testament to the man that Harry is that all three of his children are here today to support him during this time. And Father, I thank you for them. I pray a special blessing on them as well. Father, I ask you now, as we go out from this place soon, that you would remind us to pray for the elders and deacons of your church. And Father, that you would remind us to pray for one another. We know that the days are dark. We know that there are many challenges that we face each and every day. We know that our faith is being tested and tried Father, we ask that by your grace and the filling of your Holy Spirit that we stand firm, that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but that we proclaim it with boldness and clarity so that a lost world might hear it and believe. Father, I know that that is my brother Harry's heart. I know it's the heart of all the elders and deacons here, and I know it's the heart of this church. Father, I pray now that you give us the strength for the task ahead. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you what, I am excited, and I trust that you are as well. Um, as we get ready to close this morning's service, uh, we're going to sing one more song together. So I'd ask you to stand with us as we sing it now.
Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I truly hope that that is the song of our hearts as we go through our week, um, as we start that off tomorrow. Um, and I just ask that you continue to lift up uh, Faith Baptist Church and, and Harry as our, our newest elder in prayer. Um, let's go ahead and, and close with a word of prayer, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we sang, Lord, that you are just the creator of all things, Father. You oversee all things, Lord, and you are an awesome God. Father, we're just so thankful that we are, are called to be your children, Father, and that we can spend our, our, our Sunday morning in this place, Father, celebrating with our brother and looking forward to the, the things that you would have for him. Father, we're thankful that you call us, Lord, that you call us to do your will, um, Father, so we can share in, um, in the kingdom that we are building here with you on earth, Father. So we pray once again for Harry, Lord, as he starts his week out fresh, Lord, as our brand new elder, Father, and that we could be a wonderful and gracious congregation to him. Father, go with us this morning, we would pray in your name. Amen.